Hello, my name is Christopher Beatty. I'm a member of the Core Acker team at Lightbend. And in this short video, I'm going to take you through all the new and shiny features that are in Acker 2.6. So I've broken these into three categories. The first are API. The first is APIs. So we've got a whole set of new APIs. The ones we're most excited with are the new Actor APIs, which we've been working on for some time. We've also made improvements to the initialization of things like cluster singleton and sharding. We have a new persistence API for event sourcing. And we've started to use the SLF for J logger for the new Actor APIs rather than having our own API. The second category is improving production experience. So we've got a new serializer that's based on Jackson, which is very easy to use. We've removed features like auto downing, which was which was meant for development and test, but sometimes made it into production. And we've got a new default remoting implementation, which is based on Akastream's TCP. And it's uh, vastly more performant than the previous one, as well as being more reliable. Finally, I'll take you through some of the housekeeping we've done, uh, which involve removing previously deprecated features and deprecating things which we've, um, we've found better alternatives for so that we can remove them in 2.7. So the first feature we're going to talk about are the new Actor APIs. This is something I'm very excited about and probably the most the biggest thing in Acker 2.6. We've been working on these for quite some time under the name of Acker Typed, but we're now ready to call them production ready and API stable. And we're recommending that if you're starting new projects that you use these APIs rather than the classic ones. So they come in two forms. There's a function-based API and a class-based API, both for Scala and Java. To give you a, a taste of what these look like, I'm going to show you the, the function-based one in Scala, followed by the class-based one in Java. The biggest difference between classic actors and the new actor APIs is you need to explicitly define the type. This could be a, a single class, a single, say, case, case class in Scala, but more likely it's going to be a hierarchy. So in this example, the actor that we're going to define um, will process two different types of messages: uh, message, say hello or say goodbye, and they'll they both extend the command the command seal trait. So here on the right, I've got the function based API, and we use a set of factory methods or set of methods on the behaviors factory. The first we can see in use here is behaviors.setup. That is how you get hold of an actor context in the uh, function-based API, because you don't have an enclosing class where it might be available. The, the, the meat of the, the actor is where we define the actual behavior is in this receive message function. So this function goes from the message type of your actor, in this case, command, to the behavior that, of the, of, that we'll use for the next message. In this example, we don't want to change behavior so that we are just returning behaviors.same, but we could return an entirely different behavior as long as it is typed to the same command. Here we see what it looks like with the class-based API in Java. So our, our message types are very similar. We have an interface command rather than sealed trait, and we have two the two messages, say hello and say goodbye, which are classes. But instead of using the behaviors factory, we're extending abstract behavior. Abstract behavior has a single type parameter, which is the type of messages that this actor is going to receive. The definition uh, for Java involves overriding the create receive method. And here we use the builder, the new receive builder, to say what we want to do when we receive each type of the message. So when we receive say hello, we, we call the say hello method using a method reference and the same for goodbye. I've included one of the methods, so the say hello one, and we can see this types from a say hello command and it returns a behavior. And just like in the you know, function based one, this allows us to change behavior for the next message. But in this simple example, we're just gonna return this. And that is the equivalent of returning behaviors.same. So you might be asking yourself, what do I do with all my existing um, actor code uh, and actors? And Previously, we've called these untypes, but we're going to, from now on in the documentation, we're going to refer to these as classic actors. And you don't need to worry about that because they can completely coexist. You can have a classic actor spawn and watch a new, a new actor and vice versa. We're not expecting people to go and convert all of their code bases and classic actors are going to be around for a long time. 
We also have a lot of libraries in the ecosystem that depend on actor refs and actor systems. So actor HTTP, actor management, all sorts. And there's all, there's a way to convert between the, between the two. That's either going to be an implicit method in Scala to classic, or it's a factory method um, for Java. Another new feature we have is the ability to tag actors. So in this example, we're spawning an actor from an actor context. Spawn is the equivalent of actor of in the, with the new APIs, and we can pass in a props, which is an actor tags. These tags will make their way into the MDC for things like logging. But if you're using telemetry, uh, light band telemetry, then you're also able to group actors together and report their, met their metrics. This was the briefest of introductions into the new actor API. So if you want to get your, if you want to get stuck in, then I suggest you can start with the quick starts. They've been converted to the, to the new actor APIs. And then we've got an extensive documentation for actor types now. So you can head over to actor.io and, st and start with the in intro to actors. We've also taken the opportunity in 2.6 to have a look at all of our other APIs. So a couple I'm going to highlight, highlight here are the cost, are the cost of singleton and cost of shard, are the sharding APIs. So when you're interacting with extensions in Acker, in, in 2.6, most of the APIs are exposed by giving you a typed Acker. So you can see exactly what messages that you can send to it and you can see what messages are going to come back by the types of uh, actors you need to provide for the reply type. But I'm just going to highlight one example, which I think has improved a lot, and that's cluster sharding. So cluster sharding allows us to distribute a set of actors um, for different entities across a, 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 an ACA cluster. And to do that, we use two functions. We use an extraction function to get an entity ID from a mess an incoming message. And we use a an extraction function for getting a shard ID for, for a message. So we know where so we know where to send it. So this is what the code would look like in ACA 2.5. And this is copied, this is taken directly from our documentation. You've got a props that you need to pass for your actor. You've got some settings and you've got these two fun you've got these two functions. But more often than not, the sender side knows which entity it's trying to send the message to. So the information can be there. And more often than not, the uh, shard extraction function is going to be, say, the hash code of the message modulo the number of shards. So that's what we've got as defaults in ACA 2.6. So when you initialize on line three here, you don't have to provide any of those things. If you want full control, you can, but by default, it is a hash-based shard function with a number of shards which is based in configuration. We've got an extra bit of configuration or an extra parameter that we do need to pass in though, because when we're interacting with a typed actor, so with the new actor API um, via sharding, we do want it to be type safe. So now a sharded actor has this entity type key, and this has a type parameter. So when we initialize sharding here, we're going to get back an actor ref with the right with the right type. On the sending side, you can now look up an entity ref. So if you don't want, if you know exactly which entity you're sending your a message to, you can look that up. And that's how we can get around needing the entity ID extraction function. Or you can wrap the message in this sharding envelope. And in there will be the, the, will be the ID. Next up is the new persistence API in ACA 2.6. So this is a specialized type of behavior that's for event sourcing. It actually has three type parameters. It's got the command, which is the type of messages the actor can receive. It's got the event, which, are what, which is what is actually persisted. And then we've got the current state. Now, the Acker persistence knowing about these type parameters allows it to provide a more type safe API. But knowing about explicitly about what type of states this actor has, then we can also do things like automatic snapshotting. You define three functions. Uh, these are um, the initial state or the empty, the empty state. So when you first start a persistent behavior, having never started it for that entity ID, that persistence ID before, that's what you'll start with. And then you've got two functions. One is the command handler and one is the event handler. The command handler is a specialized version of the receive function that you're used to defining for normal actors. It takes in a command and it returns an effect. The effect is whether you need to persist an event or execute a side effect like replying and each time you get handed the state. Once 
if you decided to persist an event and that event goes to the database and comes back, what happens then is the event handler is called. So when you when the event handler is called, you know that the, the event will be has been persisted to the database. Another simplification we've made um, in our APIs is for running um, ACA streams. So previously you'd have had to create a materializer um, before you ran an ACA stream. But more often than not, people only use a single materializer, and that's just then another thing that would be have to be passed around their application. So now you can run you can run streams without creating a materializer, and there'll be one, and it'll use a, a default a default system. That finishes our whirlwind tour of the new APIs inside ACA 2.6. The next thing I'm going to go through are some some features and things we've added to improve the production experience of ACA. One of the most common pitfalls of using ACA was relying on the default Java serialization for messages going across the wire between ACA nodes in a cluster or persisting to a database via ACA persistence. So instead, in ACA 2.6, we've disabled all Java serialization. You can turn it back on if you want to, but we highly recommend you don't. It creates, it creates large payloads. There are, there are no security vulnerabilities. So we always advise, we've previously always advised that you would use something like protobuf. But sometimes the, the effort required to introduce protobuf was too large. So that's why we think a lot of people ended up with Java serialization in production. So what we've done is we've, we've added a new serializer to ACA, which is based on Jackson. It's not enabled by default, but it is very simple to use. You can add a dependency, add a marker to the classes which you want to be serialized. And most of the time, that's it. Uh, the odd time you're going to have to add an annotation to certain fields or certain constructors, but a lot of use cases work out of the box. And Jackson isn't just JSON. There's also a, a binary format called Siebel. The other thing which is both an API and something for production is we've started to make it easy to use SLF4J um, within actors. So if you were to get a logger here with the new actor APIs, it will be actually the SLF4J, the SLF4J API rather than our, our proprietary one. The other part is assuming that ACA ACA typed is on your class path, then the ACA infrastructure for SLF4J logging is, is enabled by default without any configuration required. The only thing you need to do is add an SLF4J implementation to the class path. For example, we highly recommend logbook and everything should just work as expected. Another thing we're really excited to do is to make Artric TCP the default remoting implementation. Classic remoting has some architectural issues which um, like vastly limits its, its, its throughput and its scalability. So we endeavored to fix that a few years ago by introducing Artry. Now, Artry's initial implementation was based on the Aaron library, which is, is UDP. And what we found is that a lot of people don't want to adopt UDP um, so that we, so what we did is we've implemented with a lot of the same infrastructure, a TCP version, which, which uses Akastream's TCP. So this is a sensible default, but we, we still highly recommend that if, if you need the highest throughput and the lowest latency to, tr to try out uh, Artry UDP if it works in your environment. Last but not least is um, a run through, a run through of the housekeeping that we've done. So ACA is a library that's been around for some time and a new minor release gives us the opportunity to remove features that were previously deprecated and deprecate features where we now think there's a better way of doing it. Two notable deprecations are the persistent FSM and the cluster client. We think with our new persistence APIs, it's best to use those to represent FSMs. And we've got some docs, which, are, which, I'm, which I'll link to, um, that show how to represent an FSM in a persistent way. Persistent FSM also persisted the data differently. And we've got a way of, of having the new APIs read that data without a data migration or having to start again. The other deprecation, cluster client, um, we generally find that our cluster client was a way of interacting with the cluster from outside. And we generally find that resulted in high coupling. Because from outside, you could message any actor or any, any part of the application, you didn't, it didn't encourage users to think about what their external API should, should be. So we're now suggesting you should use either ACA HTTP or gRPC. And we've provided an extensive sample for how to replicate cluster clients features. Next on to things we've removed. So we've removed quite a few things and the migration guide from 2.5 to 6 details them all. I'll just point out a few of the bigger ones here. 
So we've removed auto downing as part of our improving the production experience. This was a cluster downing provider that um, was included to just help with test and development, but it, it, it too often made it into production and we didn't think that was right because it didn't behave well with features like cluster singleton and cluster sharding. We've removed Akka Camel and we're suggesting to use Alpaca, mod Alpaca modules in, in, instead. And we've moved, removed the agents module, which we're suggesting just use the normal Akka actor API. There was also a classic UDP, uh, classic remoting UDP mode, um, which we've um, deprecated and removed in favor of using Eron UDP. So that's everything for now. If you're keen to get started, then I, I suggest jumping over to akka.io and, and try the try akka. The quick starts there have been migrated to use the new APIs. We've also done a big overhaul of the documentation as part of akka 2.6. We have tried to make the sections a bit more con a bit more concise. Um, all of the top level sections that you see on the website now refer to the new a new APIs. If you're still needing help with the existing APIs, the classic APIs, then just click this bottom one here, Acker Classic, and all of the the old documentation for the old APIs you'll you'll find there. So thank you very much for listening, and goodbye.